well praise the lord and uh, it's a uh, another wonderful moment that we have to share again it has been a uh, uh, a joyous time for me presenting this series and uh, this is the series the prophets and the messengers and uh, this is number 19 an appeal to common sense and uh, part seven laboring under difficulties and so uh my prayer is that um, we may learn and uh, we may also learn the things that uh, we have known to be truth which are not truth and so i want to give the lord the thanks for this day and then uh, we can be able to share in uh, his word and so i like to pray and then uh, we enter into the presentation thank you heavenly father your name be glorified forevermore thank you for taking us through the day and uh, giving us this uh, hour that uh, we may be able to learn under your presence and so as we look at this issue of laboring under difficulty help us to be encouraged as we look at the example of paul how he worked and uh, how he was able to accomplish so much with so little and father let these lessons not be a theory but uh, a practical aspect of our christianity in jesus name amen and so working under difficulties i have just uh, taken a, an example of um, Paul, because uh, he was an evangelist who labored under difficult uh, circumstances. And so I, I pray that uh, we shall be encouraged and we shall learn from the things that uh, we are going to uh, read of uh, this evening. Uh, I want to go to the book of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And um, just uh, a synopsis of what we are going to study in uh, second corinthians chapter 4 this is the chapter that I, I want us to start with as we look at this issue of working under difficulties in second corinthians chapter 4 we are told therefore seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy we feigned not but have renounced the hidden things of uh, dishonesty continued on not walking in craftiness nor uh, handling the word of god deceitfully not handling the word of god deceitfully but uh, by manifestation of the truth commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of god but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Verse 5, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for we which live are always delivered unto death for jesus sake that the life also of jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh so then death worketh in us but life in you we have the same spirit of faith according as it is written i believed and therefore have i spoken we also believe and therefore speak knowing that he which raised up the lord jesus shall raise up us also by jesus and shall present us with you for all Things are for your sakes that the abundant, abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many 
redound to the glory of God. For which cause we fail not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is a new day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And so this is Paul speaking to us that he has endured affliction and he does not endure affliction so that the glory may go to man, but he endure affliction so that the glory may go to God and to Jesus Christ in whom they walk and they live. And um, although they, they, they are persecuted, they do not despair. Although they suffer affliction, they do not consider this little affliction for a time being to be more than the glory that shall be revealed at the end of the time. And so he says, in all these things, if this gospel be hid, it is hid unto those who do not believe. But for those who believe, it's a savor of life unto life. But for those who do not believe, it is a savor of death unto death. And so this is the kind of uh, uh, the messenger that Paul was, not looking at the difficulties that he had, but uh, looking unto Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. And so, working under difficulties. Um, we are told in Acts of Apostles, page 346, uh, I'd just like to read it. Acts of Apostles, page 346. We are told, while Paul was careful to set before his converts the plain teaching of Scripture regarding the proper support of the work of God, and while he claimed for himself as a minister of the gospel the power to forbear working, in 1 Corinthians 9, 6, at sacred employment as a means of self-support, yet at various times during his ministry in the great centers of civilization, he wrote at a handcraft for his own maintenance. Amidst all this affliction, amidst the poverty of the churches he opened and ministered to, he never used his office as an apostle to gain or to collect money from the people, but he worked with his own hands so that he may not charge his livelihood upon others, and he may not burden others so that he may be able to uh, continue with the gospel. Um, among the Jewish, physical toil was not thought strange or degrading. Through Moses, the Hebrews had been instructed to train their children to industrious habits, and it was regarded as a sin to allow the youth to grow up in ignorance of physical labor. Even though a child was to be educated for holy office, a knowledge of practical life was thought essential. Every youth, whether his parents were rich or poor, was taught to do some trade. Those, who par those parents who neglected to provide such a training for their children were looked upon as departing from the instruction of the Lord. In accordance with this custom, Paul had early learned the trade of ten making. And why did he learn the trade of ten making? Because he is a minister who understood that he can go to a place and instead of being the one who should benefit from the, the church, and when I say benefit, it's not sitting in idleness and getting everything, but uh, being ministered to. So instead of being ministered to in temporal things, he is the one in turn who ministered spiritual and temporal things. And to do this, he had to learn a trade so that he may be able to help those who could not be able to help him or help themselves. And so we read in... Uh, Acts of Apostle, page 347. Before he became a disciple of Christ, Paul had occupied a high position and was not dependent upon manual labor for support. But afterward, when he had used all his means in furthering the cause of Christ, he resorted at time to his trade to gain livelihood. Especially was this the case when he labored in places where his motives might have been misunderstood. And uh, some of us ministers go to some places, as I have said before, and... Uh, we we do not find the people in uh, uh, a situation where they can help you. It is you who should help them, 
and again minister to them the spiritual word. And if you have not learned some trade to help you get some money when you are going somewhere, then it will be difficult to go to some other fields because they are so poor, they cannot afford your fare transport, they cannot afford the food to give you, but they will want to hear the good news about Jesus Christ. And that is why every minister should think about some trade to be done and some self-supporting work so that um, they may not say, I don't have money to go to some place to preach. And it was it is at uh, Thessalonica that we first read of Paul's working with his hands in self-supporting labor while preaching the word. Writing to the church of believers there, he reminded them that he might have been buried some to them and added, remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day because we will not be char chargeable unto any of you. We preach unto you the gospel of God. And you can read that in First Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 and 9. And again, in his second episode to the uh, Thessalonians, uh, he declared that he and his fellow laborer while with them had not eaten any man's bread for nothing. Night and day we worked, he wrote, that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensemble unto you to follow us. You can read that in Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. And here so there was a minister, we are told in uh, Acts of Apostles, uh, page 347, uh, paragraph 3, uh, this is what we are told about um, Paul and his labors. Acts of Apostle, page 347, paragraph 3. At Thessalonica, Paul had met those who refused to work with their hands. It was of this class that he afterward wrote, There are some which work, walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread while laboring in thessalonica paul had been careful to set before such ones a right example even when we were with you he wrote this we commanded you that if any will not work neither should he eat and uh, this is the issue you find that uh, the young men uh, and not all some would want to enter into the ministry to have an easy time reason they don't want to labor with their hands. And so when a difficulty arises, they all together leave the ministry or they will look into another ministry which can pay them better so that they may continue with the work. Many people, if help will be withdrawn from them, and uh, I'm not ashamed to say this, also in Africa, we depend so much um, uh, with uh, the help that come from USA and Europe and in Australia, Canada, and some other countries um, uh, abroad. But if this support will be cut from many ministries in Africa, then you will find that many people will not continue working. Not because we are so poor that we cannot work and have some money to do some work. Yes, we can work, although whatever we get in Africa, for the truth, it is so minimal to be able to further the work more so when we are self-supporting ministries. And we need help. Let no one cheat you, we do not need help. We need help from the brethren who can be able to help. But um, again, if support will be cut off from some ministries, the work will not continue. Not because there is no money, but because people are in the ministry because there are money. There is a uh, gain to be uh, found uh, in this um, uh, ministries from USA. Now, in every age, Satan has sought to impair the efforts of God's servant by introducing into the church the spirit of fanatism. Misguided souls have taught that the attainment of true holiness carries the mind above all earthly thoughts and leads men to refrain wholly from labor. Others, taking extreme views of certain texts of scripture, have taught that it is a sin to work that Christians should take no thought of concerning the temporal welfare of themselves or their families, but should devote their lives wholly to spiritual things. And uh, where has this um, teaching emanated from? From a misconstruing of the scriptures. And somebody will tell you, you know, in um, the period towards 1844, when uh, they were heralding the gospel of the second coming of Jesus Christ, 
field were left unlabored and nothing was planted because people knew that Christ was coming. And so as uh, we see the signs of the time and the footsteps of the high priest in the sanctuary are felt by the signs of the time, what we have just to do is dedicate ourselves to work and not labor for temporal uh, 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 survival. Brothers and sisters, whoever shall not work shall not eat. And uh, you know, the Lord has said, occupy till I come. Occupy what? Occupy the fields that I have given unto you, both in spiritual and in temporal matters. We cannot stop working and become beggars. We cannot stop working for it will not help us to go unto the poor places to preach. Paul himself was not wholly dependent upon the labor of his hands for support while at Thessalonica. Referring later to his experience in that city, he wrote to the Philippian believers in acknowledgement of the gifts he had received from them while they were while there, saying, even in Thessalonica, you send once and again unto my necessity. You can read that in Philippians chapter 4, verse 16. But inasmuch as he received some help um, from the Philippian believers, Paul did not also depend on this support wholly. He worked by night when circumstances forced it and labored by the day. And even the proceeds from his business of ten making, he was able to support Titus and he was able to support Timothy. And so as ministers who have been blessed with some skills, we can decide with my skill, I shall be able to labor and do some work and then not only support myself in the work in other fields, but support other brethren who can be able to work full time and they should not leave the field to go and look for some job to do so that they may be able to do the work. But for me, I'll do some job and support my work and also support some other laborers in the field. Uh, and... Uh, you know, the reason why Paul could work with his own hands, when he visited the church in Corinth, he finds some people there who are suspicious of the motives of strangers. And just to go there and be an idler and preach and tell the church to support you, to him it did not bother well with them. The Greeks on the seacoast were keen traders. And so he thought that uh, with his talent, he could be able to work and then uh, uh, be able to support his ministry and not bring a reproach unto himself and the ministry so that the people may just say, these people only preach to get money. And so soon after his arrival at Corinth, Paul found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. These were of the same craft with himself. Banished by the decree of Claudius, which commanded all Jews to leave Rome, Aquila and Priscilla had come to Corinth, where they established a business as manufacturers of tents. Paul made inquiry concerning them and learning that they feared God and were seeking to avoid the contaminating influences which, with which they were surrounded. He abode with them and wrote, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jewish and the Greeks. So he founded a brethren of the like same faith and who had the same talent with him. At night he worked and then left the tents to Aquila and Priscilla to sell by the day as he went to preach. And when the proceed came, he could be able to support those who were in need and also support Titus and Timothy in their labor. Later, Silas and Timothy joined Paul at Corinth. These brethren brought with them funds from the churches of Macedonia for the support of the work. And we are told something in the book of uh, Acts of Apostles, page 350, paragraph 2. Uh, i like us to see something that uh, we are told about uh, this uh, servant of God. In his second letter to the believers in Corinth, written after he had raised up a strong church there, Paul reviewed his manner of life among them. And uh, this is what we are told. Have I committed an offense, he asked, in abasing myself that he might be exalted? 
because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely. I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man, for that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Acre. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verses 7 to 10. And uh, he says, Paul tells why he had followed this course in Corinth. It was that he might give no cause for reproach to them which desire occasion. 2 Corinthians 11, 12. While he had worked at ten making, he had also labored faithfully in the proclamation of the gospel. He himself declares of his labors, Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. And he adds, For what is it wherein ye were in fear to other churches, except it be that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you, and I'll very gladly spend and spend for you. So Paul is saying, when I visit you in Corinth again, I'm ready to spend and spend for you. Meaning that uh, he will be able not to accept any help from them, but he will be the one to provide the help. And from what? From the other churches which were able and from his labors as a ten maker. During the long period of his ministry in Ephesus, where for three years he carried forward an aggressive evangelistic effort throughout the region, Paul again worked at his trade. In Ephesus, as in Corinth, the apostle was cheered by the presence of Aquila and Priscilla, who had accompanied him on his return to Asia at the close of his second missionary journey. And then we are told again in Acts of um, Apostles, page 351, paragraph 2, uh, this is what we were told when he was laboring. There were some who objected to Paul's toiling with his hands, declaring that it was inconsistent with the work of a gospel minister. Why should Paul, a minister of the highest rank, thus connect mechanical work with the preaching of the word? Was not the laborer worthy of his hire? Why should he spend in making tents time in making tents time that to all appearance could be put to better account? But Paul did not regard as lost the time thus spent. As he worked with Aquila, he kept in touch with the great teacher, losing no opportunity of witnessing for the Savior and of helping those who needed help. His mind was ever reaching out for spiritual knowledge. He gave his fellow workers instruction in spiritual things, and he also set an example of industry and thoroughness. He was a quick, skillful worker, diligent in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, Romans 12, 11. As he worked at his trade, the apostle had access to a class of people that he could not otherwise have reached. He showed his associates, he showed his associates that uh, skill in the common arts is a gift from God who provides both the gift and the wisdom to use it aright. He taught that even in everyday toil, God is to be honored. His toil-hardened hands detracted nothing from the force of his pathetic appeals as a Christian minister. Paul sometimes worked night and day, not only for his own support, but that he might assist his fellow, his fellow laborers. He shared his earnings with Luke and he helped Timothy. He even suffered hunger at times that he might relieve the necessities of others. His was an unselfish life. Toward the close of his ministry, on the occasion of his farewell talk to the elders of Ephesus at Miletus, he could lift up before them his toil-worn hands and say, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourself know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, we are told if ministers feel that they are suffering hardship and privation in the cause of Christ, let them in imagination visit the workshop where Paul labored. 
Let them bear in mind that while the, this chosen man of God is fashioning the canvas, he is working for bread which he has justly earned by his labors as an apostle. Work is a blessing, not a curse. A spirit of indolence destroys godliness and grieves the spirit of God. A stagnant pool is offensive, but a pure flowing stream spreads health and gladness over the land. The intolerant forfeit the invaluable experience gained by a faithful performance of the common duties of life. Not a few, but thousands of human beings exist only to consume the benefits which God in his mercy bestows upon, upon them. They forget to bring to the Lord gratitude offerings for the riches he has entrusted to them. They forget that by trading wisely on the talents lent them, they are to be producers as well as consumers. If they comprehend the work that the Lord desires them to do as his helping hand, they will not shun responsibility. The usefulness of young men who feel that they are called by God to preach depends much upon the manner in which they enter upon their laborers, labors. Those who are chosen of God for the work of the ministry will give proof of their high calling and by every possible means will seek to develop into able workmen. They will endeavor to gain an experience that will feed them to plan, organize, and execute. Appreciating the sacredness of their calling, they will, by self-discipline, become more and still more like their master, revealing uh, his goodness, love, and truth. And as they manifest earnestness in improving the talents entrusted to them, the church should help them judiciously. Not all who feel that they have been called to preach should be encouraged to throw themselves and their families at once upon the church for continuous financial support. There is danger that some of limited experience may be spoiled by flattery and by unwise encouragement to expect full support independent of any serious effort on their part. The means dedicated to the extension of the work of God should not be consumed by men who desire to preach only that they may receive support and thus gratify a selfish ambition for an easy life. And that is what I was saying, that um, people who present themselves uh, as ministers and will want to preach should also be asked, what is your talent? What is your trade? What is your business? If there is no support from tithes, Will you be able to still work for the Lord? Or your only part is to work when there is a reception of tithes and offering. Because many will enter into the ministry so that they may throw the burden of their families to the ministry. In that, it will not only be now supporting the work of God, but making sure that their family live with a comfort at no, at ease without putting in any effort. One of the greatest of human teachers, Paul, cheerfully performed the lowliest as well as the high duties. When in his service for the master circumstances they seemed to require it, he willingly labored at his trade. Nevertheless, he ever held himself ready to lay aside his secular work in order to meet the opposition of the enemies of gospel or to improve a special opportunity to win souls to Jesus. He never shunned from the responsibilities of attending to the gospel at the expense of doing his trade, and he never uh, shunned the responsibility of working at his trade for receiving the support from others. Paul had a balanced ministry, an appeal to common sense, that we are not entering into the gospel work to lay the responsibilities of our families to the church. And we are not going to uh, 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 leave the work of the, of the Lord for the reason of working at our common trade. As we near the end of the time, there should be balance of everything that we are doing. And who else can give us a, a good example than Paul? Paul himself set an example against the statement, then gaining influence in the church that the gospel could be proclaimed successfully only by those who are wholly freed from the necessity of physical toy. In his days, there were those who were saying that once you become a gospel minister, you are freed from physical toil. But we have found that he was the greatest example to ever live. 
that uh, this influence gaining uh this uh, uh influence gaining prominent in the church that uh, full time ministers do not need to toil do not need physical toil is uh, uh is a robbery in some way and uh, you see this is what E.G. Uh, White says in the ministry of healing In uh, Ministry of Healing, page 195, I want to read something from 194.5 to 195.1. And uh, this is what um, E.G. White tells us about those who are engaging in the work of the Lord. By instruction in practical lines, we can often help the poor more effectively. These are ministers. As a rule, those who have not been trained to work to do, uh, as a rule, those who have not been trained to work do not have habits of industry, perseverance, economy, and self-denial. They do not know how to manage. Often, through lack of carefulness and right judgment, there is wasted that which will maintain their families in decency and comfort if it were carefully and economically used. Much food is in the tillage of the much food is in the tillage of the poor, but there is that is destroyed for want of judgment. Now, we may give to the poor and harm them by teaching them to be dependent. Such a giving encourages selfishness and helplessness. Often it leads to idleness, extravagant and intemperance. No man who can earn his own livelihood has a right to depend on others. The proverb, the, the, proverb, the world owes me a living has in it. It has in it the essence of falsehood, fraud, and robbery. The world owes no man a living who is able to work and gain a living for himself. And uh, she has some, some, something to tell the ministers. Uh, and uh, this is what she tells the ministers. And this was a, 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 an, an um, admonition to Brother A. He, she said this, Brother A, you have ability to present the truth to others. You have an investigative mind, but there are serious defects in your character, which I have mentioned and which must be overcome. You neglect many of the little cultures. You neglect the little you neglect many of the little courtesies of life because you think so much of yourself that you do not realize that these little attentions are required of you. God will not have you burden others while you neglect to see and do the things that someone must do. It does not detract from the dignity of a gospel minister to bring in wood and water when needed or to exercise by doing necessary work in the family where he is entertained. In not seeing these little important duties and improving the opportunity to do them, he deprives himself of real blessings and also deprives others of the good that is their privilege to receive from him. And so, uh, again, you, you see, let me just go back to this other quote in... Um, in uh, ministers this is 3t 309.2 this brother who is a minister is told it does not detract from the dignity of a gospel minister to bring in wood and water when needed or to exercise by doing necessary work in the family where he is entertained you see this family are providing you with everything it does not detract from you to do some manual labor for this family. He says that they need that from you, even though you are a visitor there. But there are ministers who will never entertain such a thing. And we can go into details with this, but God forbid that we go into details. And so a minister of the gospel should be an example so that he may not be chargeable on everything in the family that he visits. Again, we are told uh we are told in uh 
15 MR 232.1. Your letter written to us from Golden while we were at Wallings uh, Mills with statements that you had not been situated so that you could cultivate domestic qualities is not now before me. But your letter shows that you do not see the point. I saw that you did not love domestic duties and both of you neglected to bear your share of these burdens in the different families where you made it your home. Your principal anxiety and interest was for yourselves, expecting others to be interested for you, others to care for you while you care only for yourselves. While the families you visit fulfill the gospel requirement in adopting into their family the servants of Christ, and while the servants of Christ are entitled to their care and have a right to their tables and the privileges of their home, obligations are resting upon those who receive these privileges. The obligations are mutual upon both parties. And so you may say, I have been sent in the field to do some work and I'm being hosted by so-and-so family. And I'll not share in the domestic duties of that family. Sister White says, I saw that you are not doing right. The obligations are on both parties. That uh, as they do some things for you, you also should do some things. And she says that participate in domestic duties. Your work is not to be waited upon, but there are things that even the family members expect you to do. And it will be for your own benefit if you involve yourself with those duties. Why? So that you may not set a bad example that the minister of the gospel, all they know is when they visit a family is to eat, drink, have a bath, and go to do their own work. And so we should be an example, and more so when we are laboring in difficult field, to make sure that we as ministers do not expect support from those fields, but we go with the support in those fields. And if there is a trade we can go and do in those areas for livelihood and even teach others to do the same work, it will be even a double advantage. There is a large field, um, there is a large field open before the self-supporting gospel worker. And if they do their work better, they will leave an impression that will last uh forever in the minds of the people. They will know that the gospel minister is not a lazy person. And the gospel minister, when he is um uh he when he is comfortable with the with the, the domestic work and manual labor, then he will be able to show lessons of industry in the churches he visits. Here, there needs to be a balanced mind. The self-sacrificing servant of God who labors untiringly in word, in doctrine, carries on his heart a heavy burden. He does not measure his work by hours. His wages do not influence him in his labor, nor is he turned from his duty because there is unfavorable conditions and he cannot receive the pay from the church. From heaven, he received his commission and to heaven he looks for his recompense when the work entrusted to him is done. And not only in the gospel work, but if he can be able to train the youths and other others who are able to do a work in the church to do it, then he will be a blessing and he will not feel that um, uh, his work is of a lower value, but his work will be of manifold benefit. In Acts of Apostles, page 356, paragraph 2, um, we read again of uh, these um, admonitions. These faithful workers, though willing to spend and be spent for the gospel, are not exempt from temptation. When humbled and burdened with anxiety because of a failure on the part of the church to give them proper financial support, some are fiercely beset by the, temp the tempter. When they see their labors so lightly prized, they become depressed. True, they look forward to the time of the judgment for their just award, and this buoys them up. But meanwhile, their families must have food and clothing. If they could feel that they were released from their divine commission, they would willingly labor with their hands. But they realize that, um, but um, 
they realize that their time belongs to God, notwithstanding the short-sightedness of those who should provide them with sufficient funds. They rise above the temptation to enter into pursuits by which they could soon place themselves beyond the reach of want, and they continue to labor for the advancement of the cause that is dearer for them than life itself. In order to do this, they may, however, be forced to follow the example of, example of Paul and engage for a time in manual labor while continuing to carry forward their ministerial work. This they do to advance not their own interest, but the interest of God's cause in the earth. And so you can find that uh, a gospel minister knows how to do typesetting, knows how to repair computers, know, knows how to build gardens, they know carpentry, and they can work on some certain labor. And so when they go to a city where there is a difficulty, but they can find a workshop in which they can do their trade so as to support the work they are doing and to support the churches there, it will be an advantage to them. But if they do not have any training in manual labor, then it will be difficult when they go to a field which is difficult to labor in. And so apart from the ministers only knowing how to divide the word of truth, they should also know how to uh, gain something by the handcraft or by their own hand. And so men who are chosen to go to labor, they should understand one thing. And uh, let us read in uh, Gospel Workers, 1892 edition, page 145, paragraph 2, as uh, we bring this to a uh, close. Working under difficulties. Men who are chosen of God to labor in this course will give proof of their high calling and will regard it as their highest duty to grow and improve until they shall become able workmen. Then, as they manifest an earnestness to improve upon the talent which God has entrusted to them, they should be helped judiciously. But uh, the encouragement given them should not savor of flattery, for Satan himself will do enough of that kind of work. Men who think that they have a duty to preach should not be sustained in throwing themselves and their families at once upon the brethren for support. They are not entitled to this until they can show good fruits of their labor. They are not <clears throat> entitled to this until they can show good fruits of their labor. There is danger now of injuring young preachers and those who have but little experience by flattery and by relieving them of burdens in life. When not preaching, they should be doing what they can for their own support. This is the best way to test the nature of their call to preach. If they desire to preach only that they may be supported as ministers and the church pursue a judicious cause, they will soon lose their burden and leave preaching for a more profitable business. Paul, a most eloquent preacher, miraculously converted by God to do a special work, was not above labor. He says, even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have nothing to, to and have and have no certain dwelling place and labor working with our own hands being reviled we bless being persecuted we suffer it neither did we eat any man's bread for naught but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you first corinthians chapter 4 verse 11 and uh, verse 12 and second Thessalonians chapter 3 verses 8 and so more so on the young men who present themselves that they want to be laborers in the field their families should not be thrown at once the support of the church but they should work and at their they should work in the gospel work uh, field and in the in their time they in, in their uh, uh, in their time when they are not working in the uh, gospel uh, field when not preaching they should be doing what they can for their own support this is the best way to test the nature of their call to preach there was 
order in the church when Christ was upon the earth and after his departure, order was strictly observed by his apostles. And now in this last day, while God is bringing his children into the unit of faith, there is more real need of order than ever before. For as God unites his children, Satan and his evil angels are very busy to prevent the unity to destroy it. Therefore, men who are therefore men are herded into the field who lack wisdom and judgment, perhaps not ruling well their own house, not having order government over the field that God has given them charge at home, yet they feel capable of having charge of the flock. These ministers cannot train their children to be industrious in labor. They cannot teach their own families not to depend on others for bread. And yet they would want to be preachers. What kind of knowledge will they pass to the churches they minister unto? It will be a message and a knowledge of idleness and laziness and a lesson of dependent more than being independent. And so, as we look at Paul and his labors, we find that we can uh, really find happiness and a blessing in how he worked. And this manual labor in difficult field did not detract any dignity from Paul. He remained an apostle, he remained a servant, he remained a prophet, and he remained a, 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 a slave to others who could not find anything to eat, and he provided for them. And so let us be encouraged. And let us work for the churches, not only to gain from them some wages, but also we may be a benefit to them in where they are lacking. We cannot afford now to give place to Saturn by cherishing uh, an, an orderly life, being idle, being busybodies, being people who only cause disunion, discord, and strife divisions in the church and not bring anything profitable unto the church, but yet expecting to be profited by the church. And so I'd just like to say that um, we should know better we who are living in the end times. And more so, we who are saying we are self-supporting ministers. By the way, let us not have that name as a theory, but we should have it as a practical name, self-supporting ministers. We should have something to bring to the people, not only in spiritual matters, but in temporal matters. And I know the Lord will bless the works of our hands. Otherwise, may the Lord bless us and may he continue guiding us as even we enter into the end times and we travel this narrow path so that we may not be a cause of people refusing truth because they think whenever they see the minister, they, they, they will part with their money. They, you know, it has been um, a habit, even in some places, whenever people see a gospel minister, they close their doors because they know that once the minister will come in their houses, the only thing they'll say um, they, they will want is to live with something rather than leaving something there. And so uh, let us be ministers who, when people see, they'll not close doors on them because they think that uh, uh, they, they, they are going to have another burden after a, a, a burden. And uh, I know if we can learn a trade, we can help other youths also learn a trade. And when they get into the field, they'll not just be ministers entering there to get wages, but they'll be ministers entering there to spend and expand of themselves otherwise god bless us and uh, let us uh, give thanks as we end this heavenly father you have just given us knowledge not only in spiritual matters but also in temporal matters also and so help us lord to work with our hands where we cannot find support that we may be the ones who will give the support and as even the brethren who are able opens their hand to support the work, may we not get used only to receiving, but as Paul says, 
that uh, Christ said it is blessed to give than to receive. So let us be apt to giving than only receiving. Praise be unto thy name, our Holy Father in heaven. And praise be unto Jesus in whom all blessings flow through. Forgive us for the duties we have neglected. And give us a zeal to work both in spiritual and temporal matters. In Jesus' name, amen. May our Heavenly Father bless you and keep you until the next presentation. Bye for now and God bless.